<laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, so the sound isn't working through any of this for just a little snippet, but you've all seen Fur Wheel and probably have heard it as well. So it's not that hard to imagine. That's like in the middle somewhere. So I'll just try to play it from here just from my computer, but just for ambiance. Okay. Um, and I just want to thank um, Lottie and uh, also earlier Chris Bailey, uh, Rachel, of course, um, just for this whole thing. I, I think Carol Lee would be so uh, happy and amazed and impressed by the exhibition that you have brought together. Uh, it's just a really stellar uh, exhibition. And this symposium has been wonderful. Um, uh, as she mentioned, I'm on the Carolee Schneemann Foundation, the board, and um, one of my, uh, they asked us our wishes and dreams for next year, and I said, I want to promote the legacy of Carolee's work with younger people, even younger than you guys, like in the high schools, <laughs> grade schools. But you know, there's problems with like uh, censorship and what's allowed <laughs> to show a little kid. But um, I think it's all good and healthy, so I hope we can do more of that. All right, I'm going to try my best to use this contraption. Um, mine is, um, I'm going to read it, but I'm going to try to come up off the paper. And um, It's a bigger arc. We're going from the archive now to, and so it's kind of nice because it'll be a little bit of a review of a lot of what we saw today, but through sound. Um, and um, the other thing I wanted to say, which is really sad, is that, um, and wonderful, because um, I was very close to Carolee in the past 10 years especially, and one thing that was so awesome, but troubling, <laughs> challenging, was I could always show her what I was working on in relation to her work. And she was a great editor. And of course, we would have some tug of wars over certain things. Uh, and often she would graciously step back and say, you're the writer. And uh, that also happened with me and her in terms of other things we did together where I'd say, you're the artist. It's ultimately your decision. We can talk about that in the Q&A. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Carolee Shaman's sense of how sound works is deeply tied to how she thinks about the gestural throughout her work. A gesture emanates from a particular, to quote her directly, source of compression, tension, expansion, resistance. That's why in several of her most renowned works, like Meet Joy, and snows. She introduces the idea of a body package, packages that work, to borrow from Antonin Artaud, as philosophical states of matter. Schneemann's earliest uses of sound were conceived through structures she called her concretions, works that position the materials of painting and collage on an equal playing field with the biosemiotic possibilities of the body, such as newspaper event, lateral splay, and chromolobia. <coughs> the latter were preceded by a series of compact box sculptures, such as Controlled Burning for Yvonne Rayner's Ordinary Dance, Music Box Music, Ice Box, and Controlled Burning Fireplace. Though now ultimately inert in terms of active sound, these sculptures were initially conceived with audio elements as central materials the sounding of glass as it burns, the buzz of the wind-up device, and its analog delivery of halting, fragmented, romantic music box tunes, fans blowing against broken glass and shattered mirrors. These early works, in a sense, were micro-studies of how sound could structure a work within the situation in which it occurs, as opposed to emerging from some pre-existent structure, such as notation, symbolism, or arrangement. They signaled works to come, such as Meat Joy, Noise Bodies, Viet Flakes, and Snows, in which Schneemann's experimentation with sound encouraged a unique, a unique kind of spatialization, pushing sensual and body packages of once mute fur, paint, reflective surfaces, consumer products, texts, out into a complex corporal sonic field. Underlying the arc of this brief paper are at least two critical premises one is that Schneemann's early realization of the equivalence between sound and gesture led her to think of the sonic beyond accompaniment to image, indeed as a decentering force 
that is our tone and tone, could develop, guide, destroy, or change thought and perception definitively. Indeed, as mentioned above, her extreme experiments in which she would set smaller box assemblages on fire, often filled with symbolic destruction, such as music box music, music, again, in which she incinerated the pre-programmed cylinder for the song, Mary Had a Little Lamb, left cultural tracts gendered other and artifacts, little girl's songs, and distorted or barely recognizable forms. As she moved from miniature detournements into more spatially complex environments, as well as expanded experiments in film, her sonic interventions addressed the isomorphic and often deeply political relations between bodies, locations, texts, tapes, and voices. Glass environment for sound and motion at the Living Theater in 1962, which included Yvonne Rader, Judy Ratner, Arlene Rothline, and then Rainer Rothline Schneeman would go on to form the early core of the group at Judson Dance Theater, is one of the expanded realizations of these early, more compact studies. Working with the composers Philip Corner, Malcolm Goldstein, and Andre, Andre Cadet, Schneemann created a kind of live algorithmic score in which each performer was assigned specific actions to be repeated throughout the duration of the event. One was to keep her actions small, round, compact, and unselfconscious, while projecting innocence and efficacy of temperament. Another was to cultivate controlled wildness, poignant energy, and Yvonne Rayner was to exhibit pressure inwards, strength, intensity, a severity, explosiveness. <laughs> but equally equal important to this typology of movement across varying bodies is a list of sounding materials. Hammers, electric fans, nails, balls, poles, bells, violins, trombones, boxes, chairs, and flashlights. With a focus on their sounding potential throughout the space, collaged as it was with broken glass, mirrored glass, safety glass, fused lumps of glass, drilled and hung in clusters in varying planes across the stage, instructions for both props and bodies included, quote, hammers to smash the wired glass, to sound on glass, nails to be hammered in and across the stage, to be scattered, and all movements to have potential of creating sounds within the glass environment, improvisations are to be developed as interrelated and mutually informing. And I said to Carolee, you would never get away with that today. That? <laughs> Although she, she might know in her. Glass environment for sound and motion was a prototype for other works to come like newspaper event, ladder display, chromologian, as I mentioned, while working with experimental composers like Corner and Goldstein, and especially her partner and collaborator James, James Tenney, as well as listening deeply to the work of Morton Feldman, John Cage, Steve Reich, Lamont Young, Pauline Oliveros, and Yoko Ono, and others, she began to think about the parallels between emergent scores and music and the cumulative force of visual, physical cues in her concretions. The latter she described as being structured through a kind of centrifugal force. For example, in Chromolodian, mounds of clothing and materials accumulated over time became layered and exponentially grew over the duration of her performance, taking on the shape, this is a direct quote from her to me, of a circus big top or an ice skating rink. Just love that. To most critics, Schneemann's Chromolodian <clears throat> work looked like, to quote Jill Johnston, one of the most important Judson critics during this time, who also at other times lauded Schneemann, but for Chromolodian, she's like, this is a messy, brainless happening with lots of clothes, rags, burlap, and paint. But the aggregate movement of what Schneemann describes as, move, as movement as a set of object equivalences often had the effect of the kinds of computer-generated glissandos that Tenney achieved in his spectral works. And I'm going to talk about this, hopefully in the, the Q&A a bit, about spectrographic and spectral music, which I think Schneemann's creating a visual analog to. Schneemann was well informed about the works Tenney was composing and told me that she often would experiment on some of the sound recording technology that Tenney brought back home for Bell Labs. She, like Tenney, was interested in a phenomenological rather than a semantic approach to sound. 
Thus, Schneemann's use of sound, especially in her gesture-based concretions, was an attempt to achieve a spectrographic effect across both psychoacoustic and physical objects in which the elements of movement, fabric, color, and light would mirror or extend ideas related to harmonic fusion, residue pitch, and as well as modulations in amplitude and frequency. During the same year's environment for sound, Schneemann made the vertiginous fur wheel. Okay. A little clinking, clanking in the back on here. Constructed out of a lamp shade base, oil paint, fur, tin cans, mirrors, glass mounted on motor powered wheel, preceded by her painting Pinwheel, that's in the show, it looks gorgeous, from 57. And, and in that work, the base of the canvas is secured to a potter's wheel, and viewers were welcome to give it a spin. Fur wheel expressed the move Schneemann was making from compact miniature reflective universes in boxes to more and more kinetic, expansive works. Her experimentation with sound encouraged the spatialization, pushing sensual embodied packages of once mute fur, paint, reflective surfaces, and here, consumer culture's products out into a more complex kind of composition, one that had to be seen and heard in order for its aesthetic existence to be understood fully. Fur wheel felt like something embodied as well as animistic, an inviting but potentially dangerous place, invoking the vagina dentata with its shards of broken mirror besmeared with paint, lined with fur, and equipped with a primitive alarm system of clanking smashed up canned goods, sporting barely legible, ironic brands like Orange Crush or Ballantine Beer. As Spiros Papadros has described, animistic phenomena are not only apparitions of what one wants to see, but are also, as in the, in the experience of the uncanny, Momentary, momentary projections of what one does not want to see and what one fundamentally refuses to acknowledge. The concretions and other works to come... Oh, now it's working. <laughs> Carolee's here. She's here. She's here. Scary. That's scary. And beautiful. <laughs> like I body... <clears throat> Good break. Oh. Anterior scroll, fuses via flakes, terminal velocity, would exude similar uncanny hybrids, or in the eyes of many viewers and critics, downright abject taboos, half object, half animal, part liquid, part solid, half living, half dead, and part technology, part flesh. The latter is best represented in another important shame on sound work entitled, which I wrote about in the catalog, Noise Bodies that seem to have replaced the fur and fur wheel with flesh or indeed entire bodies. In fact, the very specific bodies of Carolee Schneemann and James Tenney. As Schneemann would describe it, own body sound system, crazy dressing each other and all the metal parts, hooking on refrigerator tubes, ice trays, carburetor vents around our legs, balancing the noise, squeakers, flashlights, teapot tops as breasts, moving in the blackout slowly, the indefinable clanking staccato percussion of the metal costumes as we walk the length of the darkened hall, we begin to touch and play the sound of our debris bodies, furious, cacophonous, exit, totally concentrated on pitch and timbre of our strikes. Noise bodies made the body itself into a sonic environment or instrument. Realizing the notion of her earlier concretions on a profound level in which, as she proclaimed, my concretions provide for an intensification of all faculties simultaneously. In noise bodies, seeing, hearing, feeling, all joined together in a kind of ballet mechanique. The guts of domestic comforts, refrigerator parts, car parts, plexiglass discs, that look like record albums, grapefruit juice cans, teapot covers, both dang on act as a funny cyborg-like armor over bodies, sounding their escape from their singular narrow uses in the consumer home. In a sense, noise body makes central the expanded sonification that meet joy initiated. Her concretions, albeit constructed from bodies sporting domestic debris, become more clearly instruments of sound. In meat joy, body packages are composed of a total meshing of the body with other compositional materials, such as paper, paint, and plastic. In snows, 
They are tied together with rope, laminated with either tin foil or white grease paint, which I want to come back to in the Q&A, which we talked about earlier. It starts very early in her work, this, this white face, intensifying the reflective surfaces of bodies, working as both ready-made sculpture, photographic material, and sounding boards. These body packages roll and spin or are pulled by other performers across the stage, producing kinetic patterns of light and sound. While Schneemann integrates the body into a system of photographic material, tinfoil replacing paper, serving as a kind of photosensitive outer lining for the body's malleable package, she also transforms the body system into a kind of recording machine an affective, soft machine that is capable of both reception and production. To use her words directly, the performer's voices are instruments of articulation, noises, sounds, singing, crying, commentary, honor against their movements may be spoken, words, sound formations are carried forth, which relate to, grow from the effect on the vocal cords of a particular physical effort they experience. In Snows, Schneemann used her film made a year earlier, via Flakes, as the main projective vehicle whose images of the winter environment and Vietnam atrocities, that's her quote, would generate the intensified movement and visual densities that would spill out into what she called the snowbound audience. Viet Flakes was shot by using a magnifying glass that mediated between Schneemann's camera and magazine images of Vietnamese victims, producing an eerie animation of suffering and pain. In Snows, performers' faces are at one point marked with white grease paint, their bodies and hair powdered and caked with the artificial snow of white flour, and they wear largely white clothes until tinfoiled, and they move across a space that is garlanded with white fleeced branches that, Carolee told me, were recycled last minute from a nearby department store. That is awash with filmic projections of snowy white landscapes, snow-filled streets, snow-encrusted buildings, and the deadly white negative filmic space that occurs in between war victims whose skin, burned by napalm, glistens with a white-like hue in Viet Flakes. Representations of whiteness during this period symbolized violence across so many lines, not just abroad, but at home as well, on the front lines of the civil rights movement, racialized, monetized, sexualized. Snow's white-on-white -white rat set radically veered away from the white monochrome painting as practiced by Robert Rauschenberg, Rob Ryman, and Agnes Martin. But the Cajun redefinition of silence as sonic presence inspired by Rauschenberg's white canvases, pulsed at the center of its soundtrack, structured as, as it was by her collaborative effort with James Tenney on the sound collage for Via Flakes. Fragments of <clears throat> Bach's Cantata No. 78, The Beatles' We Can Work It Out, Mozart's Piano Concerto No. 20, De Shannon's What the World Needs Now, you know that song, <laughs> the enemy's folk songs, train whistles, and random sounds of orgasm, played against each other, stopping and starting like the artificial snow that fell not so silently over the entire set. If compression is what defines the earlier constructions of Schneemann's work, in which the burning of the music box delivers the contorted frequencies of burned out American childhood melodies, gendered and codified, the expansive use of utopian-themed pop chart hits and authoritative European masters interrupted and cut up by the laments of Vietnamese folk songs, locomotive whistles, and the disturbing, totally disjunctive sound of a woman's orgasm is what floats us, not unscathed, across the white noise of political and social violence examined in Schneemann's work of the mid to the late 60s. And I'm cutting it short and ending on the last two sentences. Schneemann, way ahead of her time, was already exploring the equivalences between hearing and seeing that would only come to dominate the critical work of structural filmmakers like Paul Sherritz, Hollis Frampton, Tony Conrad in the late 70s. Acknowledging the accepted adage that vision localizes, sound spatializes. Schneemann then went ahead to radically reverse its terms. Song for Schneemann became a way to expand vision. In brief, 
Schneemann incorporated sound technologies into her work, not only as a way of expanding aesthetic and sensory space, but as an ongoing investigation into how social and political knowledge circulate beyond the visible, and how the sonic, thus delivered, has the potential to disrupt our temporal comfort. Thank you.